I'm so happy to welcome Jonathan Rose to Politics and Prose this evening to discuss his new book, The Well-Tempered City, What Modern Science, Ancient Civilizations, and Human Nature Teach Us About the Future of Urban Life. As you probably know, our cities are growing. It's predicted by the year 2080, we will have 80% uh, of the world's population calling cities of one form or another home. In this hopeful and thoughtful and philosophical book, uh, Rose takes us through his reasons for investing in the city so that it can work to solve some of our most pressing societal problems. Comparing the workings of a city to the harmonies composed in a piece of music, Rose sees the potential of human engineering to redirect the growth of cities, to be more inclusive, equal, and to work all things together for the betterment of society. For Jonathan Rose, city dwelling and building is in his family history. His father, Frederick Rose, was an apartment house builder uh, with a social bent toward better housing uh, opportunities for all. Jonathan Rose has taken the torch and run with it uh, with his own career as the founder uh, of the investment, development, and urban planning firm, Jonathan Rose Companies. The work he's done for cities has received rewards from the Urban Land Institute, uh, the American Institute of Architects, and the National Trust for Historic Preservation, among others. Uh, he's one of the nation's leading thinkers advocating um, for a holistic approach to bringing about the next generation of sustainable, thriving, and dynamic urban spaces. Um, so please join me in welcoming Jonathan Rose to Politics and Prose. Thank you so much for having me, and it's a great pleasure to be here. I love being in bookstores. I love the smell of bookstores. I love... I love just looking around at all the books and all the ideas, and I endlessly order them and never have time to read them all. And I also love the people who want to be in bookstores. So I thank you all very much for coming tonight. And this room is also has many people I don't know, but many old friends and medium old friends and some newer friends, and I'm glad you're all here. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk for maybe 20 minutes or so about uh, some of the ideas in the book. And then what I'd love to do is open it up for a conversation because, so I've been, uh, I'm now more than six weeks into this book tour, and it's been a really interesting learning experience for me, and particularly we talk about local issues anyway, so I'd love to hear from you too. Um, every city in the world, and all of us in fact, are affected by some things that I call the megatrends. These are things that are so, they're, so one of them for example is climate change. Climate change affects the whole world. And although each city can, re and each one of us can do our bit to try and reduce it, in fact, uh, we ha more are, have to respond to it. The world's population is growing towards 10 billion peop uh, people. Demographers say it should stabilize at 10 billion around 2050. So you mentioned the, uh, we're rapidly globalizing. Uh, income inequality is growing in an interesting conundrum. For much of the world, there's a rapid move out of poverty. Billions of people are moving out of poverty. And yet there are still billions in poverty. And we're seeing this divide of income inequality growing increasingly. We're seeing that the world does not have enough resources for the people that are on it. As we grow in population and we grow in prosperity, we grow in consumption, and our systems are not working. So one of the things I've observed, or found really interesting, is the times that civilizations collapse. There's been, this is human-caused climate change. There has been natural occurring climate change throughout human history. And it's very interesting that when um, civilizations grow very prosperous, and grow very unequal. And they consume, they grow to the max of their consumption level. So they're, they're using all the water that's available in the system. Or they're using all the forests or all the food. And then um, cl the climate changes. And there's a little less food, or a little less water, or a little less forest. And the, resource, if the resources are not fairly allocated. Those civilizations collapse. Uh, from internal disorder. And we can actually tell that because you see the civilization declines very rapidly, often by fires, burnt down. Um, and I say this as a warning. My, my book is a very hopeful one, and I propose a lot of solutions that I think can get us through the situation that we're in. But I also think we have to be really clear-eyed about uh, where we are today. Um, I was particularly intrigued by how did cities come from? Where did they come from? Because my sense is if we could understand the roots of cities, you know, what's so, I love evolution, and evolution's a theme that runs through the book. If 
we can step backwards and look at the earliest DNA of how something had thrived, was successful in its evolution, maybe we could learn from that. The first known building uh, was built about 1250 BC, and it's a, it's a temple in southern Turkey, and it's called Gepi Teleki, Gepi Te Gep 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 Teki, and uh, it's an amazing uh, bigger than Stonehenge, huge rocks that are not that were carved with incredible, you know, half human, half beast figures. Um, it was a place of religious ritual. We know that because we see in, um, in the burial grounds uh, or surrounding it a, a huge amount of slaughtered oxen and things like that. Um, and um, and so what was the purpose of this? So this is before we have any, any known huts. I mean, uh, I'm sure people made thatched huts or mud huts. Even those things were able to kind of archaeologically tell if they existed. There's no sense that there had been any settlement in human history, and yet people built this incredible place. And the reason they said they built it was because that was the spot that the gods gave humans the grains that would be the basis of future civilization, and they were to celebrate it. They didn't even, we did there was no, remember I said there's no other building, so who knew what future civilization was? And by the way, who knew what grains were? Because people were still hunter-gatherers and eating some grains. It was not actually till a, um, a climate change event that happened about 2,000 years later. The very interestingly, um, the summers got shorter, the winters got colder, the water, there was a drought, the water, uh, there was less rain. And so the grains that survived, actually over a 300 year period, the nature of, of grains themselves changed and those that survived had um, uh, bigger seed heads that had uh, more calories in it because it had to sustain itself through the winter. Anyway, that whole bunch of characteristics that became the stuff, those founder uh, wheats, the emmer wheat, et cetera, barley, that we then grew civilization on. How did these people know? And here's what's even more interesting, archeology, I'm sorry, uh, uh, biologists, uh, ecologists now, you know, we can do uh, DNA tracking back, and they think that the original grains came within 20 miles of that spot. So it's amazing that they figured that all out. But at any rate, the point was that that building was built because it was, um, the culture then was seeking uh, the harmony between humans and nature. And they would take great spots that they felt were the spiritual spots or generative spots, and that's where they build temples. The, um, there's a archaeologist named Klaus Schultz who said, first came the temple, then the city. And at the root of every single city for the first many thousands of hum years of human civilization, and not just in Mesopotamia, but all over the world, we see first there was a temple. First there was this place that tried to balance humans and nature. Um, about uh, 8,000, 9,000 BC, we started getting small towns, and uh, one town, then another town. We began to getting agriculture, and um, uh, and then slowly more and more towns. And the next thing we see is that when the towns began to connect, and they began to connect because they had different things to trade, and they had things to trade because they had they were differentiated. For thousands of years, towns existed. People walked. They could have traded, but there was nothing to trade. So it was this differentiation of goods and that began to lead to this interconnection zone. And that interconnection zone covered about 1,500 miles from India to essentially Europe. So you begin to see this emerge. And, and as trade grew and people, these towns became more um, connected, they became more complex in themselves. And they became what they call proto-cities. They weren't really cities yet. The first known city uh, is a city called Erudu, uh, which is in uh, uh, southern Iraq. And um, uh, and then that began the, the city making. And by 2200 BC, in Mesopotamia, 90% of the people lived in cities. So cities were the spiritual centers, the cultural centers, the economic centers. Um, there's another interesting fact about inter the early cities. They were extremely equal. They had the high priests and the emperors and people kind of ran them. But then, and we can tell this because archaeologically what we see is essentially every home was the same size. So you didn't have the whole territory of mansions. And we also can tell by the goods that we can find buried in the homes that there was a pretty much, that people had highly differentiated roles, but prosperity was fairly equally shared. 
And what I draw from this is, and remember I told you the story of collapse, that the two lessons from the founding of cities were, number one, that the purpose of cities was to balance humans and nature. There, And all the early cities were founded on that. And the second one is that the responsibility of the city is to provide for the equal opportunity of all. And um, I think if we can keep that ecological balance and the human social balance in mind, then there's a great pathway for cities. As I was writing all this, and I've been writing this book for years and years and years, and uh, 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 I had many, many thoughts that needed to be made more and more co coherent, um, my editor said to me, uh, you really need uh, a better theme. I, I gave her some early material, and she said, you need a better organizing theme. And uh, she was right. And within that material was this idea of temperament. Um, so let's explain what temperament is, and then I'll explain how it relates to cities. So um, 2,500 years ago, Pythagoras observed that the distance between the notes on a lyre were the same proportion as the distance between the planets. It's an amazing observation, and he was math mathematically quite correct. Um, and he then said, therefore, this is the golden proportion, and this proportion is the best way, to, that's the way nature wants to do things. This is the best way to design uh, everything that humans do. He was, and, and in fact, that proportion we see throughout a lot of nature, but not all of nature. And um, so he's a little bit incorrect. And, uh, um, but ever since then, people felt that the Pythagorean ratio was the ideal ratio. By the way, they did not listen to his wife. His wife, uh, who is a philosopher named Theano, proposed something called the golden mean. She actually said everything in the universe is not perfect. Everything tends towards compromise. And it's in the compromise, uh, she, she was obviously a less rigid person than her husband, it's in the compromise that we actually, um, where the most productivity is. So what happened was that for the next 2,000 years, every musical instrument in the Western world was tuned according to the Pythagorean perfection. And they sounded really good alone, but they sounded poor, uh, quite annoying if you tried to tune, put different keys together. And then a problem was called closing the circle of fists, which I won't get into, but it occurs when you have this Pythagorean perfection of tuning. A mathematician in China solves the problem that comes through the Silk Route, ends up in Europe in the late 1600s. Um, temperament is proposed, and temperament is exactly what Theano had proposed. You tune the scales, not perfectly, but almost perfectly, but you find this compromise in between where all the ca scales can be played together. I call that a new operating system called temperament. And at the same time, a new technology for music making came about called the clavier, which is a forerunner of the piano. Bach was an amazing composer. He had an enormous vision, and that was he was a deeply religious man to take the magnificence, the architecture of the universe, and manifest it on Earth. And he was limited by the previous tuning systems. All of a sudden, with temperament, he could integrate 24 major and minor keys on a keyboard into one incredible piece of music. To demonstrate how to do that, he wrote The Well-Tempered Clavier, book one, and 20 years later, book two. And it was done as an instruction manual, but it's also this incredible accomplishment. And this idea, so any of us who work in cities know that one of our biggest issues is that the elements of cities are so segregated. We now know that to solve poverty, for example, is an issue of health and the environment and housing and education and, and so many pieces that have to be woven together, that we have disaggregated our problems and we need to reintegrate them. So temperament became, and I, which was this vast integration, and it was for a higher purpose, became a theme for me. Because I, too, believe, as I described before, that our cities should have a higher purpose. So now, how do we uh, make this real? So I begin by believing that cities really need to have a vision. They need to have an extraordinary vision. And one of the things that, um, uh, so I've been to a lot of cities on this book tour. And one of the things that I have seen is that our cities all have some vision, and they all have some goals, but I don't believe they're big enough to solve the problems before us. I'll give you an example. I was in Los Angeles. There are, oh, let me back up. There are 20 million American families that spend more than 50% of their income on housing. And they spend, 
at least 20 percent and often more on transportation. There is more suburban poverty than there is. This is an interesting thing to me about this whole presidential campaign, which has been talking about the inner cities, when in fact the issue with most, many, not most, many of our inner cities is rapid gentrification. And actually, there's more suburban poverty in America than urban poverty. The um, second, I forgot where I was going. I do, thank you. Thank you very much. So there are 20 million. So in Los Angeles, there are 500,000 people who spend more than 50 percent of their income on housing. And there you, 99% uh, of the places you live, you need a car. And if you can't afford a car, people take buses. They spend, lower income people spend more than 90 minutes a day getting to and from their work um, so because they live far away from their work. The sit there are 47,000 homeless people in Los Angeles. Today on the ballot to, for next week, um, the people of Los Angeles are, are, will vote on a $1.2 billion um, bond issue to provide 10,000 units of supportive housing. It's a fantastic thing to be doing. It's, it's generous. It speaks of a city deeply committed to solving a problem. But that's 10,000 units. There are 47,000 homeless people. There are 500,000 people who really can't afford to live there. And if you look at the trends between the rate that income is growing or not income versus the cost of housing growth, you can see the projections are in 10 years there will be 100,000 more homeless people in LA. So we do not have a vision that arises to the level of our problems. You could say the same thing about climate change. You could say the same thing about the quality of education. We are not educating children for the jobs of the 21st century. We know, for example, we can see the trend of automation, uh, the autonomous vehicle, the self-driving car and bus and truck uh, will put a huge number of people out of work. The uh, largest uh, job category for males in America is driving something. In 20 years, most of those jobs will be gone. We can see these things. We do not have a vision that is large enough to set a goal to uh, deal with them. So I think what's amazing to me about cities is many of you can imagine how hard it would be to create consensus, all the things we really need to, on a national vision. I really hope we create a national vision. But Cities are a place where actually people do get together and they do set common goals and, and they do function for the common good and where I really believe we can set visions that are large enough if we're challenged to the scale of our problems. We then need to completely change our systems about how we address these problems. We currently use very static systems. Cities will do a new master plan every 20 years. Um, imagine if we move to dynamic systems. So we now can set what are called community health indicators. Many cities have done that. These are, uh, you can put a number, a metric, and measure anything you care about. And what's great about a community-based process to develop community health indicators is not like a fight where my indicators win and yours lose. You can have hundreds of indicators. So for example, the city of Santa Monica, it not only measures its climate impacts and its a degree of affordable housing and its job housing balance and the length of its commuter time, but it also measures the number of students who are in advanced placement classes and the degree that people vote in off-year elections and the amount of drug abuse in its uh, student population and, and the amount of homelessness. And you can, you can take all the issues you care about and, and figure out what is the optimal state. Where are we now? Where do we want to go? And we can measure that. And now with big data, we can measure this in real time. We can actually state our vision, understand the degree to which we're there, and then we can dynamically apply the tools the governments use of regulations, investments, incentives, leadership, and continually adjust these. So investments we make, for example, in infrastructure, or in tax abatements, or in healthcare systems, or investments in schools. We can now adjust those and continually track, are we getting closer or farther away from our goals? So I think there's actually an amazing opportunity to achieve big visions. Um, so, but it needs us to move from a static system to a continually dynamic system. That is much more uncomfortable because it means the rules will often change, but the goals will remain constant. Um, I mentioned that box system allowed for something called the circle of fists, which just allows you to move through a circle of, um, of keys and uh, connect them all. So, and I also said that with climate change and resource uh, uh, depletion, 
um, we're going to run out of things. We have a linear system. Uh, 98% of what enters the city in terms of water or food or materials or energy leaves within six months as waste. In a, that's linear. In a circular system, we begin to s connect those, to recycle those. The city of Windhoek, which is the capital of Namibia in southern Africa, was in a desert country that was growing. The desert was growing because of climate change. The population was growing. They were running out of water. They brought in an engineer, and they designed a system in which they take their wastewater, they clean it up, and they um, put it back into the drinking water. And they have... The engineer designed this said, we have to judge water by its quality and not its history. In 40 years, they've never had an accident. It works really well. The city has grown prosperous. It's doubled in size because they're recycling their water. In the drought parts, filled parts of the world in America, we need to do this. There is a, a water treatment, new water treatment plant for the Washington, D.C. area that is taking the nitrogen and phosphorus out of the water, which has been polluting the rivers, the Chesapeake Bay and the Potomac, and is for $100 a ton, and it's selling it to fertilizer manufacturers for $400 a ton. It is taking the methane gas and it is burning it and using it to not only power the plant, but power homes nearby. All of a sudden, this waste treatment plant is a factory. Imagine if we took all of our wastes. Uh, San Francisco, by the way, is close. They, take, they recycle 80% of their waste in San Francisco. So all the organic wastes, and, um, uh, they, they compost and turn back into food. Imagine if we s created these cycles, you create more resilience, you create more local jobs, you would create, um, uh, it has a lot, of, you know, less environmental impact. It has a, a very, very positive uh, solution. So circular, creating something called a circular economy and circular infrastructure begins then to take us towards what does it take to make more resilient cities? We need green buildings. We can then begin to connect things. There's an emerging field called microgrids where uh, you can take, so imagine if a bunch of buildings all have solar on their roofs and they're taking their waste and it's being methane generated into, um, into biogas and we're recycling that and you actually take their waste heat. There's a, uh, a district between the university um, in Minnesota and the uh, hospital which is beginning to do some of this. And you kind of start circulating heat and circulating energy and circulating water. These microgrids are much more resilient to uh, big power outages because they have multiple sources of, of power. They, you can create what are called self-healing networks which basically means there's so many multiple pathways. If you know, like the main power goes down while the solar kicks in and the batteries kick in to make, and uh, power you're taking off of car batteries and it all uh, rebalances itself. We get, the technology is actually easier to rebalance than communities itself. In 1997, there was a great heat wave in Chicago and over 700 people died. And they, a demographer um, named Eric Kleinenberg, who, by the way, has a great book called Going Solo that may be available here, um, uh, studied the heat wave. And what he observed was that um, the death rates were lowest in the wealthy white neighborhoods and the highest in the poor black neighborhoods. But there were two poor black neighborhoods whose death rates were lower than the white neighborhoods. And the reason why is they had fantastic social networks, that they had people who church-based systems that had been checking in on the elderly for years, long before the heat wave, and making sure people were fed and that they were attended to and that they were safe, and that these social networks actually proved to be enormously important to resilience. So we had, uh, another uh, uh, scholar from Chicago named Robert Sampson, uh, who also wrote a, wrote a great book called The Neighborhoods of Chicago. Um, uh, then mapped all the many characteristics of all the neighborhoods of Chicago, and what he observed was there's something called collective efficacy, when people actually act together, and when they, and that makes a difference. When you believe acting together can make a difference, and then you do act together and it makes a difference, that creates a virtuous feedback loop, and that is a key to the resilience of cities. I've also discovered what I think is a key that eats away, that corrodes at the resilience of our communities. And by the way, uh, this is something, a phenomenon that is not only an urban one, it is a suburban, it's all across the world, but prevalent in America. 
and it's something called adverse childhood experiences. And adverse childhood experiences, when a child experiences neglect, abuse, abandonment, uh, uh, domestic violence at home, they're living in a neighborhood where they see a neighbor shot, um, each one of those events puts the child's brain into the flight fight mode. And if they have four or more by the time they're four, it permanently rewires their brain. And we now know from huge health uh, studies, uh, started originally by Kaiser Permanente uh, in California, that uh, they will be twice as likely to have diabetes and twice as likely to have asthma and one and a half times as likely to have cancer and a whole series of diseases, very expensive diseases and and uh, salts on their well-being are the outcome from this. Additionally, because their brain, once they're in the flight-flight mode, their, their cortisol levels are always elevated and their adrenaline levels are elevated, they also can't pay attention to very poor school performance because they're always afraid of the next threat. And I've told you how important social networks are. They don't make friends because they're wary that people are threats, and so they have very they're unable to form supportive networks, which are so key for our thriving. In the pre puberty -pre -pre years, they're in the flight mode, so very recessive. In the post-puberty, they move into the fight mode, join gangs, high-risk behavior, um, seven times more likely to be teenage pregnancy, et cetera. Um, so this is a social condition that is creating a neurological condition that is epigenetic, which means it passes on through gene expression from generation to generation, and it is undermining the fabric of our society. Everything else I described to you, microgrids and you know circular economies and all those things cannot be implemented if we do not have a society that is unified towards a common goal and that uh, that is made of people who, whose lives are filled with well-being. It actually takes well-being to become part of collective efficacy. And so to get there, my final conclusion is we must be a compassionate society. We must actually commit that we, our mission is to heal every child. The, the America was founded as a land of opportunity. That opportunity was very poorly distributed, but it is, I believe, in our national mission in our DNA. We have seen a trend that has improved but not perfected the distribution of that opportunity. I believe that we, remember I said we need a vision, that our vision must be that we, um, that we commit that every person in America will have an equal access to health, to well-being, to living in a thriving society, in a safe society, that every child has an equal opportunity to grow up and be the best that they can be. And that it is only that commitment that, one of the things you uh, recognize when you do a lot of urban studies is we, what continuously becomes clear is that our fates are so intimately tied together. And that we must, you know, as Martin Luther King said, we are woven in a web of mutuality. And it is only when we deeply recognize that and then commit that we heal all of us, that the only way to heal ourselves is to heal all of us together, do I believe that we can really come to a well-tempered city. I want to end with a quote from uh, an architect, um, Christopher Alexander. He wrote a wonderful book uh, called um, The... Uh, something way of being. The somebody's got to know this. I can't believe I forgot the name of the book. Anyway, the something way of being. Chris, timeless way of being. Thank you, uh, Christopher Alexander. In, in it, he says, "Making wholeness heals the maker," and so it is by making as we make wholeness in the world that is what heals us. Thank you. So there's mics there and there. So go ahead. Hi. I uh, really enjoyed your talks. Very interesting. So you say schools are not preparing the children for jobs in the future. What kind of jobs are there going to be in the future? Everything I read sounds like there's going to be very few jobs available. And they're even talking about um, 
giving everyone a guaranteed income instead of jobs because they won't be there. Right. What's your thinking on that? Okay, so first of all, I want to talk about the they that talks about giving everyone a guaranteed income because the jobs won't be there. I found a lot of these days are in Silicon Valley, and they are the ones who, with the artificial intelligence and robots, and they're all very excited about. It. I actually spent about two days visiting all that. Um, they're they're the ones who are saying, "Yes, this is going to be an amazing new world. We're going to put everybody out of work." Those are also the companies that are offshoring all their income and not paying their taxes. So I'm really, I really would like to see the they that propose there'll be a guaranteed income for everybody also be contributors to the guaranteed income for everybody. The issue, here's my sense, 2050 will be a population of 10 billion in the world and America's population will be something like 400 million. So we'll be 4% of the world's population. My sense is that there is a, so this is not a global solution, but there is enough opportunity for entrepreneurial thought leadership for us to have a pretty full engaged um, employment here if we train people. So what we've learned is, so, you know, the, the American public school system was designed to do a really good job to train people for the industrial future. And so they did in the curriculum. If you look at the curriculums of the 1920s, uh, the school, we had a fantastic public school system. And, and people, if you graduated from high school, there was a full employment possibility. I mean, the depression came, but in general for you. The skills of the 21st century are not uh, rote technical skills. They're actually skills of collaboration. They require enormous social intelligence. They're about co-creation. They are um, actually about dealing with diversity. They're a much more flexible um, kind of knowledge. I'll, I'll actually tell you a story about this. This is in the book. So that's what we need to train. We actually need to train people. We don't know what those jobs are, but we know we have some outline of the capacities needed for those jobs, and that we need to train. So in the book, there's a story in, in 1970. Uh, there were national court orders uh, that uh, said that we have to um, integrate our schools. And Detroit, which was then 80% white and 20% black, there were riots. The Ku Klux Klan and the John Birch Society burned buses. And the bottom line is uh, they did a very bad job of it, and today, uh, 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 Detroit is only 4% uh, white and the rest is minority. Uh, people fled to the suburbs. Louisville, Kentucky, because of local leadership, said uh, we're all in this together. Remember I said how important that is. They merged the city and the county school district so you couldn't go to the suburbs. It's all the same school district. And then everybody had to say we're all in this together. I was just in Louisville on the book tour on purpose because I wanted to see it. Manual High School, so remember there are many cities and things called Manual High School. That's kind of like for the dumb kids who aren't good enough to go to college and need to learn a trade. Still called Manual High School is now one of the top five high schools in America. It's in an inner city neighborhood. Parents all over fight to get their kids in. So they built a school system. It is not perfect. Every school is not equal. But opportunity is well equally distributed, and parents actually, a lot of them want a bus because they want to get their kids out of the neighborhood school to a better school, which may not be in such a wealthy neighborhood. They have just adopted a program called the Compassionate Schools. Oh, sorry, I should say one more thing. Louisville has one of the lowest unemployment rates because the Chamber of Commerce markets that our kids are best prepared for the future because they know how to deal with diversity, and they've done an enormously successful job of attracting foreign companies to come to Louisville because um, Europeans, et cetera, feel like uh, they can work with this much more flexible population. Uh, and the Compassionate Schools program, which is now teaching social emo emotional learning and a whole series of things, it's taken, and I've visited it, I think is, is curing, by the way, adverse childhood experiences and is taking those kids to the next level. So it's, it's I know I didn't answer the what are the skills, the trades we need, but I, but we have an outline of the skills we right, need. Right, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I'm a physician. Part of the answer to that is that lots of jobs in the future will be service jobs, and they don't have to be low-paid service jobs. Uh, I mean, there's nothing magic about manufacturing either. That had to do with unions. But my question is, uh, you're talking about cities of a certain size and scale, which is not necessarily too big. There are already I have 50 cities in China or something with more than 20 million people. 
Um, and that's not happened organically. That's because the Chinese are bringing the people in from the countryside because they will do better in cities. The jobs are higher, more productive than farming a little piece of uh, land that's been farmed for, you know, centuries. Um, have you looked at the Chinese cities to see whether your theories would work there, or is that, I mean, all, all you've talked about so far are kind of Western, right. um, Western history. Um, so, so the answer is absolutely, and, and since I'm speaking America, I tend to speak more about um, sure. American cities, but in fact, uh, the book follows the very emergence of Chinese cities, so it has a, I told the Mesopotamian one, it actually has that emergence of Chinese cities. Um, and, and they are much more committed to the, uh, until recently, mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese cities were much more committed to the sense of harmony and, in fact, and this balance between humans and nature. Uh, they had this, um, I don't know how much detail to go into, but they had an amazing system actually for uh, how their farms and regional towns and, and everything was all integrated in one, one magnificent tapestry of city planning that actually covered the entire country. Hmm. Uh, and the reason that emperors either thrived or eventually got uh, uh, deposed was whether they were felt to be harmo harmony keepers. That was the responsibility of, of the emperor. Um, I actually, it's part of the writing for the book, I actually did a tour of Chinese cities and looked at them and know a lot about the planning of the new Chinese cities. So first of all, the people don't actually, many of them don't want to leave the rural areas. You're absolutely right, the little farms are being consolidated, that's because China has a food gap and they think they right. can produce food more efficiently. They are forcing people off the farms. There are currently 300 million people who have been rural, they've been moved to the cities, but in China to live in a city you need a permit. Right. And the permit gives you the right to education, to health care, and to housing. There are 300 million people who don't have this permit. So what China is actually doing is, is currently there's an exploitation going on in which, so those people, can they're basically illegal immigrants, uh, live in crowded dormitories, they live in illegal places, so there, there are I think 500,000 who live in the sewer system and stuff and uh, you know, in tunnels and stuff mm -hmm. uh, under Beijing. Um, it was not, I, I actually, there's somebody is there exact, don't quote me on the 500,000, I'd like to be really accurate. It's a large number, I don't remember exactly what it is. But so China is, uh, is not giving those people the legal permits so they're stuck in a never, never land. China knows it has to resolve that, it is moving towards resolving it. Its cities until recently have been planned as pretty soulless places designed as real estate development. So there's a whole other issue, which is China doesn't have real estate taxes. So the only way cities can pay for their budgets is to expropriate um, agricultural land, uh, upzone it into developable land, sell it off to developers, keep the profit, and use that to pay for the running of the city. That says that game doesn't ultimately work, and those cities are getting too big, too congested, um, and they're going to have to move to a real estate tax system. But nobody in China wants to pay taxes, so they're kind of stuck in this place. It's a very, it's very interesting to see. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, some comments about your very, very interesting aspects that you presented, and there are so many of them. Uh, basically related to the mega trends, uh, population growth, uh, increased lack of natural resources from water to electricity to power and to many other materials. And that this may lead to increased need for communities to work together to solve the problem together. But it might as well happen that it increases tensions between communities, between s countries, Certainly between countries, there, you may, we may have increased tension leading to much more confrontation rather than to more cooperation. And this has been throughout human history. You can have mass migrations from countries that don't have enough food or water invading neighboring countries which have more. The same within the, a, a particular community, even in the US. You may have a situation in which a city develops so many inequalities and tensions and problems that you have a flight from inner cities or from the city as a, itself 
by the wealthy who can afford to build their own wallet, co wall, wallet communities with their own security, which you already have. But it just may be increasing over time if tensions increase because of all these trends, which is perhaps, in my view, more likely than leading to more cooperation. So it's a big question how it will develop. The trends exist, it will create problems, how we will cope with the tension coming from the problems. So uh, what you've described is a, is a pattern that we've seen a lot throughout history. When there's resource, not enough resources, the powerful cord more, and, and there's a lot of conflict that comes from this. So the answer to me, which is this idea that we have to recognize we're all in this together, we have to figure out how to have more equal distribution. Um, uh, you know, John Kennedy said, ask not what your nation can do for you, but what you can do for your nation. <clears throat> we have had leaders who have said we're all in it together and let's begin to solve our problems in a, in a, for the common good. Uh, I'm looking at Bruce who's, uh, Bunting, who's <laughs> from uh, deeply connected with Bhutan, where the government said our goal is to create gross national happiness for all of our residents. I know it's a small country. Um, I actually believe we're at a very critical point, and that I hope that our next president, our next Congress, our next senators, our next mayors, our next governors are all look this issue squarely in the eye and see what you have described, which is that if we don't solve this problem, we are going to create the seeds of enormous internal conflict, which is which will bring us all down. I'd like to hear your thoughts on um, kind of the various civic actors within within a city. So you mentioned church groups, for example, as a uh, you know key part in keeping the uh, uh, well, I guess the survival rates higher in Chicago during a heat wave. Um, there's been a lot of talk about public-private partnerships, for example, having business, having uh, philanthropy, having nonprofits being kind of part of this governance of the city. Um, so I'm just curious to hear kind of where in this uh, kind of vision of advancing a well-tempered city do you see each of these civic actors and what are the limits of having a group like, say, the Chamber of Commerce or a, a private, you know, kind of business involved in, in these uh, discussions? Really good question. So the, um, the basic idea of a mayor and city council uh, leading a city is a good one and is a durable one. Um, the, the, actually, the form of government we typically use with a mayor in the United States uh, goes back to, I mean, you can try, you see roots of it all the way back early in history, but actually goes back to the Hanseatic League. It's starting around 1100 in Germany and then traveling across the North Sea and ending up in Amsterdam and, and coming here. Um, it, in the very founding of that, there were a couple principles, and the first was that um, there would be no nepotism, so you couldn't have relatives serving. Uh, there was enormous transparency, um, and there had to be a commitment to serve for the common good. I believe very much in public-private partnerships. I believe in the private sector. I run a for-profit company. I believe in the not-for-profit sector. I've been on the board of a lot of community development organizations. I know the amazing work they can do. Um, I believe in the separation of church and state, but I actually deeply believe that the holders of the sense that we are all in it together, that that is at the root of all of our religions, and actually we need more of a sense of spirituality. We need to figure out how to actually permeate society with all that. I've also seen across America, I, actually I'm gonna tell you, I'll tell you a story, but I've seen across America, um, in general, really good mayors and leaders. That the mayors tend to not be Democratic or Republican. They tend to be get my city done. And so you'll see a lot of Republican mayors who've signed compacts on climate change. They won't do that in Congress, but they do that at the, the mayoral level. We need better systems, as I described, of actually setting our goals, knowing where we are, and figuring out how to evolve towards them. We need... Um, the, there is a form of influence that we have come to accept in America uh, of lobbying inference, of finger on the scale. Um, in general, our cities have very low levels of corruption. 
Uh, but there are high degrees of influence, and it can be uh, union influence, it can be big business influence, and we need to be much more transparent about that, and we need to develop a culture that says, yes, we need to hear what our unions have to say, yes, we need to hear what our um, businesses have to say, but then we need to sit back and, and make the best decisions for our cities. And, um, I've seen cities where that works and cities where it doesn't, and it really has to do with a civic culture. Again, going back to Robert Sampson, what he noted was that those leaders who are most egotistical, most narcissistic, and most it's about themselves and their power, their constituents do the worst. And those leaders that are the most what we call network weavers, that they're about building collaborations with other for the common good, for, uh, those there, actually their residents do the best. So we need a way as the voters, the people, the citizens of a city uh, to, um, to, to have enough transparency to see that, understand where that's happening, and then hold our leaders accountable. Thanks. Okay, last question. Okay, thank you. Great, great, uh, great talk. Um, thank you for the big vision that you've laid out. Uh, a lot of que uh, quite a few questions, but I'll just ask one since we only have one. Uh, big don't big visions need big bucks? Uh, yes. A a and I'm thinking, do we need to really rethink how we finance and pay for all of what we need? Um, and what are your thoughts on that? I'm thinking specifically, for example, about here in D.C., we're struggling to pay for our transit system. Uh, and and we, there's not enough money to maintain it, basically. That's because of the skewed subsidy that we have, where we're putting more money in roads than we should be and less money into transit. But all of this will cost money. What's your thought about right. what we need to do? So you just answered it, which is that we're just putting money into the wrong places. So. Another thing that's in the book, in uh, if you look at all the OECD countries, there are 27 of them, I believe, and those are the most developed countries in the world. The United States spends far more than all the others, almost twice as much as the average of the others, on health care. And yet we have much worse outcomes than the other countries. Interestingly, most of the other countries spend far more than we do on prenatal care, on early childhood education, on daycare for parents, on family work leave, on affordable housing, on social support networks. And what ends up happening is when you invest in those things, you actually get much better health outcomes. At a, and if you look at the combined cost of lower health care, more on all these other things, they're still spending about the same dollars per person that we're spending per person. So the answer is we could, we can reallocate our dollars. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying we need more dollars. I just think we need to spend them in better ways. I'm going to give you another example. I worked with a not-for-profit, uh, the YWCA of White Plains. We built housing for uh, women over 50 or formerly homeless or very low-income wage workers with multiple mental health and physical health issues. The Y provides wonderful support services, but the women were experiencing, of their 180 or something live in this project, 11 hospital emergency room visits a month. The Y implemented a telemedicine program in which once a week the women put their finger in a little thing that measures their blood oxygen level, their pulse and um, uh, pulse oxygen level and blood pressure goes off to the Westchester County Medical Center. What comes back at night is recommendations on diet, exercise, and prescriptions. Uh, within a few months, they got that down to two hospital emergency room visits a month, saving the system about $500,000 a year, the medical system. So now imagine if we lived in a society that said we were going to create these savings and then cycle them back. How could we use that saving? to then enhance the health and well-being of those women? What if it was split 50-50 between the YWCA of White Plains that could then expand its social services and the hospital, which could use that 250000 for more community-based care? By the way, there's another really interesting book out called Dying and Living in the Neighborhood um, uh, by Prabhjot Singh, uh, which is about how you create a neighborhood-based distributed health care system. Uh, 
So my sense is it's a question of use, reusing the money we have enough. Thanks.